Good afternoon. I'm John Iannion, Director of the University of Michigan Institute for Healthcare Policy and Innovation, or known as IHPI. I'd like to welcome everyone to the fourth annual IHPI Director's Lecture, Better Health Through Better Partnerships, with our special guest, Dr. Jerome Adams, the U.S. Surgeon General. We're pleased to see such a robust turnout, and we welcome the many individuals who are joining us through our live stream, as well as those following the conversation on Twitter with the hashtag IHPI18. Our university-wide institute was established in 2011 to find solutions to the most pressing challenges facing our nation's healthcare system. Our institute brings together more than 500 faculty members from across the University of Michigan's top schools in medicine, public health, nursing, engineering, social work, law, business, public policy, pharmacy, dentistry, and others, as well as more than 20 University of Michigan research centers and programs. Our researchers collaborate across diverse disciplines and professions, looking for ways to evaluate and improve the quality, safety, equity, and affordability of healthcare. We focus on evidence-based innovations to transform healthcare policy and practice to help people live longer and healthier lives. Today, we have the great honor of welcoming U.S. Surgeon General Jerome M. Adams to the University of Michigan to participate in our event, Better Health Through Better Partnerships, which is also Dr. Adams' slogan for his term of office. I look forward to an engaging conversation with him about his priorities and goals as Surgeon General and his vision for addressing public health challenges through a wide range of partnerships. Following our initial chat, Dr. Adams and I will be joined for a panel discussion by Dr. Joni Caldoun, Director and Health Officer for the Detroit Health Department, Dr. Rebecca Cunningham, Associate Vice President for Health Sciences Research, Director of the UM Injury Prevention Center and Professor of Emergency Medicine, and Dr. Chad Brummett, Associate Professor of Anesthesiology and co-leader of the Michigan Opioid Prescribing Engagement Network. We'll invite audience members to submit questions for the panel discussion throughout this event. Those who are here in our live audience can fill out the index card that you can find at your seat and hand it to one of our event volunteers in the blue jerseys. For our live stream audience, you may submit your questions through our web browser or tweet them using hashtag IHPI18. After the panel discussion, students from the University of Michigan School of Music, Theater, and Dance will present a special musical performance about the opioid epidemic, a topic that has emerged as a key priority for Dr. Adams and all of our panelists. After the performance, we'll adjourn to the lobby for a reception with light refreshments, which all of you are welcome to attend. In addition to the members, uh, Dr. Adams and the members of our panel, we have some special guests to introduce. Uh, we'll have uh, Dr. Kimberly Dawn Wisdom, uh, Senior Vice President for Community Health and Equity at the Henry Ford Health System and previously serving as Michigan's first Surgeon General. Joining us, we also have Janet Olszewski, former Director of the Michigan Department of Community Health. We have Dr. Eden Wells, the Chief Medical Executive for the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services, also joining us today. Now I'd like to welcome Nick Lyon, Director of the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. The state has been an important partner to us here at the University of Michigan in guiding our priorities for research and evaluation, including Michigan's expansion of Medicaid, known as the Healthy Michigan Plan, and for our collaborative efforts focused on the opioid epidemic. I'd like to invite Nick to come up and give us some welcoming remarks. Thank you, Dr. Anian, and uh, thank you for this great opportunity to welcome uh, Surgeon General Adams here to Michigan. Um, today's event, Better Health Through Better Partnerships, is something that I've certainly strived to do as uh, the first director of the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Breaking down barriers between entities for the benefits of individuals is, is part of my daily job. Um, we think about the, the determinants of health and what we do to improve people's lives. Uh, making sure that they have an environment where they can live healthier and live better is a key component of what we do in the department. Um, you know, the same focus extends to our university partners, and, and I want to thank uh, U of M and IHPI not only for their work in ensuring that um, nearly 670,000 people are covered by the Healthy Michigan Plan, but also their work with the prescribing, the opioid prescribing engagement network. This is one of the key uh, actions that came out of the um, Governor's Prescription Drug Task Force. I had the opportunity to serve under Lieutenant Governor Kelly and chair the, the health portion of that committee. Um, much of what we're doing, we're going to talk about today, uh, involves a comprehensive approach that's being taken on this issue. Our work here, uh, certainly part of it, is focused on what we can do to work together 
with higher education to help ensure that medical education evolves with the rapidly growing field of how to incorporate best available evidence-based practices to treat pain or addiction. That includes undergraduate, postgraduate, and continued medical education. Certainly, a key component is ensuring that we can get the drug-saving treatment, naloxone, into our uh, emergency responders' hands, into family members' hands. And uh, under the leadership of Dr. Wells, uh, we now have 54% of our pharmacies that have dispensed naloxone. Um, more than 1,300 doses are out there that I'm sure has saved people's lives on a very regular basis in the state. But we'll know, we all know, uh, through our public health leadership, that if we don't change the environment around health, that we don't change the environment around the stigma around addiction, that this would continue to be a problem that would be very difficult to overcome. I was struck by um, Dr. Adams' leadership in Indiana when he was dealing with the HIV epidemic in Scott County, I believe it was. And one of the things that I remember that was said about Dr. Adams, I think by Vice President Pence, is that what was remarkable about Dr. Adams was he led from the front. On behalf of uh, the state leadership in health, on behalf of the University of Michigan, who's been a great partner with us, we are ready to join with you and lead from the front. Thank you, Dr. Adams. Thank you, Nick. Uh, now it's my pleasure to officially introduce U.S. Surgeon General Jerome M. Adams. Dr. Adams received his bachelor's degree in biochemistry and psychology from the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. Go Retrievers. <laughs> Go Retrievers. <laughs> Uh, we're we're hyped, hyped about basketball this week. <laughs> we, we, we were happy to see your team succeed last week, so thank you. Uh, he received his Master of Public Health degree from the University of Cal California at Berkeley and his medical degree from Indiana University School of Medicine. He's a board-certified anesthesiologist. Dr. Adams served as Indiana State Health Commissioner from 2014 to 2017. As Health Commissioner, Dr. Adams presided over Indiana's efforts to deal with the unprecedented HIV epidemic caused by needle sharing among people injecting drugs. In this capacity, he worked directly with the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, state and local health officials, and community leaders to stem this HIV outbreak. He also helped with the successful launch of Indiana's state-based, consumer-driven approach to Medicaid expansion, and he worked with the state legislature to secure more than $10 million to combat infant mortality in the high-risk areas of the state. As Surgeon General and Vice Admiral since September 2017, Dr. Adams oversees the U.S. Public Health Service Commission Corps, which includes 6,700 uniformed health officers pr who promote, protect, and advance the health and safety of our nation. And I'm thinking you're probably one of the few people in the world who served as both a vice admiral and a general, so <laughs> I really congratulate you for that. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Adams. So, Dr. Adams, you were the health commissioner in Indiana before being appointed U.S. Surgeon General. Can you discuss how those roles are similar and different and, and your role in, in both of those positions? Well, that's a great question. And before I get started, uh, again, I'll say that I really, really was excited about UMBC being the first <laughs> 16 seed to, to beat a one seed in the men's tournament. I was disappointed to, to see them leave, but... University of Michigan is my new UMBC. <laughs> U <laughs> UM is the best college remaining, so you all are my UMBC <laughs> today. But you asked about, uh, asked me to compare and contrast being health commissioner with being Surgeon General. And what's interesting is when I was Surgeon General of Indiana, I had, or health commissioner of Indiana, I had a, a lot of control over programs and over budget. I could determine uh, on a day-to-day -day basis where millions of dollars are going to be directed and whether they're going to go to infant mortality or diabetes or hypertension. And that was a very unique opportunity and uh, we were able to make a lot of positive change 
in regards to health in that state. And as Surgeon General, I don't have as direct control over those programs. I work with many folks within the Department of Health and Human Services who have control over programs, but I have what I call the, uh, the two C's, the power to convene and uh, the power to communicate. I'm able to bring people together. And if there's one thing I want to come out of today, it's not that you all hear from me, it's that everyone in this audience meets someone else who they haven't met before, because I'm not going to solve your problems here in Michigan by myself. You all are the ones that are going to solve the problems here in Michigan, and hopefully I can be part of that solution. But that power to convene is, is tremendous. And then the power to communicate, uh, to effectively and efficiently uh, communicate the science around health to the American people, and to help you all become more effective communicators. And I had a wonderful conversation with the students earlier about the difference between activism and advocacy, about the overlap between science and policy, and about how to become more effective advocates for the causes that you believe in. Thank you. So I think it would be helpful to our audience to learn more about the Office of the Surgeon General. It's, I think, one of the most well-established positions in the federal government. I was reading it dates its origins back to 1798, almost yes. as old as the country itself. But what is the office responsible for, and, and, and how does it function? It's one of the most well-known and least understood positions. Uh, the Office of the Surgeon General has, uh, I, I like to think of as three main um, subcomponents. Number one, I'm the head of the United States Public Health Service, which is why I get to wear this uniform. There are seven uniformed services. Most people know about four, maybe five. Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, Coast Guard, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, and then the United States Public Health Service. 6,500 of the best men and women dedicated to protecting and promoting the nation's health, uh, doctors, nurses, pharmacists, environmental health engineers. We were the only uniformed service to provide medical care on the ground uh, in Africa during the Ebola outbreak. I was in Puerto Rico in the U.S. Virgin Islands as part of a team of 1,200 people who went over there from the United States Public Health Service to respond to the uh, public health uh, disaster that existed there. And it's an incredible honor to be able to wear that uniform and lead the public health service. That's one part of it that folks see visibly but don't always understand. I'm running a 6,500 person agency uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. And it's, again, it's an honor and an opportunity to, to positively affect health. There's a nation's doctor role. And that's what people uh, think about and remember when they say see Everett Koop, or, you know, or, or they think of David Satcher, they think of that nation's doctor role. And again, that's where the, the convening and the communication comes in. It's uh, trying to effectively communicate the science around health so that every policy decision is informed by the science. And then the final role that I get to play is one as an advisor, and that ebbs and flows depending on the administration, but I'm very fortunate to be able to be an advisor to the President of the United States, to the Vice President of the United States, to the Secretary of Health and Human Services, Alex Azar, and to, to bring back uh, feedback from convenings uh, such as the one we're having today. One of the things that I had lunch with Alex yesterday, and he said, make sure you take time to listen to what the concerns are in Michigan and bring them back to me so that we can better inform our policy. It's tough when you're in D.C. It's tough because it is a bubble. And it's why, uh, why we're all, as, as HHS advocates, employees, um, representatives, out across the country so that we can hear what's working and hear what's, what, what are challenges in your communities. Thank you. So you've been in your position for a little over six months now. What are your priorities as Surgeon General? Where are you hoping to move the country through the role you now have? Well, thank you for that, David. One of the things we talked about earlier is, is the frustration with playing whack-a-mole. And what do I mean? I could have picked a disease. I could have picked diabetes. I could have picked high blood pressure. I could have picked stroke. I could have picked cancer and decided I was going to focus on that. And we could have moved the needle on that issue in a, uh, in a meaningful way. But one of the things that I learned in Scott County is that if we solve the opioid epidemic 
the HIV outbreak that's going on down there, but we leave it at that. Well, guess what? Scott County is also the county in Indiana that had the highest smoking rates. It's also the county that had the highest diabetes rates. It's also the county that has some of the highest uh, high school dropout rates. Uh, we really want to move upstream, and that's why my motto is better health through better partnerships, and why I'm focused on forging those partnerships as the primary focus of my tenure as Surgeon General. I also would like to put out a Surgeon General's report. And Surgeon General's reports, uh, for those of you who aren't familiar, are the main tools by which uh, we make our lasting mark as Surgeon General. Uh, Surgeon General's report on smoking. People remember that. Um, it, it's, a, it's a chance to, to raise awareness about certain issues and about possible interventions. I'd like to do a Surgeon General's report on health and the economy. Number one issue people vote on, Democrat or Republican, is jobs and the economy. Number two issue people vote on, Democrats or Republicans, is safety and security. You know what they don't vote on? Health. They don't ever vote on health. Uh, you know, occasionally you'll get a blip. Oh my gosh, we're scared about Ebola. And it pops up there for a little bit. Or, oh my gosh, opioid epidemic. And we'll talk about it for a little bit until it goes away. But it still rarely makes it into the top five, uh, if it does make it into the top ten. And uh, I'd argue <clears throat> that still in that instance, well, there's, there's an immediate fear that comes and goes. Um, or we talk about health care being up there. I don't see health care as being a discussion about health. It's more discussion about jobs and the economy. People can't pay their bills because they're going bankrupt trying to pay their medical bills. And so even that is a discussion about jobs and the economy. But we know that communities that are healthier are more prosperous. We know that intuitively. We know that if you're healthy, you're going to be more likely to show up to work. You're going to be more productive while you're at work. Uh, and if you have a healthy community with complete streets and grocery stores and, and clean air and parks, we know that the young people in this room are going to want to move there. They're going to want to be part of that community and part of that workforce. And again, the community is going to be more prosperous. So I'd like to do a report showing the connection between community health and overall prosperity with the hope that we can engage some new and non-traditional partners uh, in our fight to, to lift up community health. And then I'd also like to supply a toolkit uh, for individuals because I don't like to, to just say, here's the problem. I'd like to also say, here's some possible solutions. And if you haven't had a chance to look up Blue Zones or you're not familiar with Blue Zones and John Buettner, go online, YouTube it. There's a great 10-minute presentation that talks about Blue Zones uh, and the tools that communities can leverage to lift up their health. Great. Thank you. So our institute here at the University of Michigan brings together faculty and students from across campus to try and develop better evidence that will inform policy around important issues in healthcare and in public health. What would your advice be to the students in our audience here in the auditorium and watching on the web? Um, how can they make a contribution to advancing the work that, that you're pursuing? Well, I spoke to a small group of students earlier. One thing I would say to you is people say you're the future. I, I don't like that. I don't like that, that phrase. I don't like uh, that, that mindset. You're the now. In Washington, D.C., uh, when I go on the Hill, uh, I always like to take students with me because the people in Congress, they, they, they want to hear from you all. Uh, they, they value what you say more than what I say. I tell folks, you know, people roll their eyes when they see me coming because I'm, I'm the no fun guy. Don't smoke, don't drink. Don't, don't, don't eat those french fries, get out and exercise, but they already know what I'm going to say, <clears throat> and they perceive me as having an agenda. The students, they know that you all just care about making the world and your community a better place, and so number one, don't underestimate your ability to change the world right now. You don't have to wait. Get involved, engage uh, your, your legislators, work with, work with uh, uh, thought leaders and policymakers. You know, great example from recent, just very recently. Who would have ever thought, I told you a year ago, Florida would enact massive changes in, uh, in, the, in, in the way that they look at firearm safety? There's lots of you all who would have bet me any amount of money that Florida would not be the first state to do it. But those Parkland students, I am so incredibly proud of them 
because they took a trage tragedy and used their voice to facilitate a conversation. And whether you agree or disagree with the ultimate outcome, what we don't want to lose sight of is that they were able to use their voice and, and change the, what, what, the way we discuss things and actually get a, a, a bill passed that many people didn't think would be passed and that uh, we haven't even ha been able to have a meaningful discussion about on a, on a national level. So before you became Surgeon General, uh, you're an anesthesiologist by training. You were chair of the Professional Diversity Committee for the American Society of Anesthesiologists. What did you learn from that experience, and how can we promote greater diversity in the healthcare professions and public health and other related fields? You know, what's interesting, here's another uh, thing to look up. I'm giving you all lots of homework. The students are like, we would have never came if we'd known that. <laughs> It's a great publication by Robert Wood Johnson called A New Way to Talk About the Social Determinants of Health. And what they did is they polled 4,000 voters, not 4,000 people, 4,000 voters, because it's a great saying, democracy is not ruled by the majority, it's ruled by the majority who participates. And, uh, and they polled them on uh, words such as equality, diversity, um, equity, and they found that those, those uh, words consistently turned off voters. Why did they turn off voters? Because when you have those conversations, you automatically group yourself into one of two groups. You're either the oppressed or you're the, or you're the, or you're the oppressor. We need to, to be able to have a conversation with individuals uh, that shows them how they all fit under the tent. And uh, when I was speaking earlier with, with the students, I said, you know, talk about people with disabilities. Every, you know, um, almost all of us know someone with a disability. Talk about veterans. We know veterans uh, aren't getting the care that they need and that they deserve when they come back from serving our country. Talk about rural versus urban disparities, particularly here in Michigan. We know some of the, those are some of the worst disparities that exist. Show everyone how they fit under the tent. Show them how diversity matters to them instead of just expecting that continually pounding them on the head with the fact that someone else is not doing well is going to somehow get them excited about, about addressing those disparities. And I believe that there's a case to be made in, in almost every situation that, that, that diversity helps everybody, that lowering disparities helps everybody, but we need to be better about making that case. And I'll finish with a quick example before they um, uh, you know, switch over to questions. Chattanooga, Tennessee, and I gave this example earlier, but I'm going to frame it in a very different way. Chattanooga, Tennessee had a uh, Volkswagen plant come into town, and they found out that the people there were so unhealthy that they couldn't actually find enough folks who could pass a physical to work in the plant. So they gave them an hour on the clock uh, to work out each and every day. Many different lessons from this story, but engaging the business community uh, helped their bottom line uh, by, by making the community healthier. But guess what? Chattanooga, Tennessee also has a higher proportion of uh, minorities, particularly of African Americans, than the rest of the country on average. So if we had looked at that through an economic lens versus a disparity lens, we could more easily engage the business sector and show them how addressing health disparities is going to help their bottom line. It's really figuring out how to be better partners. I told this story earlier too, you know, I've been married 16 years and I'm still painfully learning the lesson that things go my way a whole lot more when I seek to meet my wife's needs as opposed to trying to, uh, try, trying to force her or expect her to meet mine. I can't force her to do anything, her or my daughter. But, um, <laughs> But, but when I try to meet their needs, they're a whole lot nicer and a whole lot more receptive. And we've got to show folks that addressing diversity is meeting their needs, that raising up health is meeting their needs, uh, as opposed to expecting them to automatically adopt our goals and our metrics. Great. Thank you very much, Dr. Adams. I'd like to invite our panel members to join us now up front. And as they're coming up, I'll do some brief introductions. Uh, first, we have uh, sitting next to Dr. Adams, Dr. Joni Caldoun. Uh, she's a graduate of the University of Michigan, go blue, and now director and health officer for the Detroit Health Department. She's also a practicing emergency medicine physician at the Henry Ford Hospital. As Detroit's chief health strategist, she executes the city's health agenda through collaborative partnerships, evidence-based programs, and a social justice lens focused on the resilience and strength of Detroiters. 
Under Dr. Caldoun's leadership, Detroit launched an 18-month community health assessment bridging health systems and public health in an effort to reduce infant mortality and unintended teen pregnancy. She's the driving force behind a proactive strategy to address lead poisoning in children, the restructuring of the city's animal welfare services, and collaborations to tackle the opioid epidemic and violence as public health issues. Previously, Dr. Caldoun was the chief medical officer for the Baltimore City Health Department, where she oversaw seven clinics and focused on robust partnerships to address the opioid epidemic. Welcome, Dr. Caldoun. Thank you for having me. To her left, your right, is Dr. Rebecca Cunningham. She's the director of the CDC-funded University of Michigan Injury Prevention Center, Associate Vice President for Health Sciences Research at the University of Michigan, and Professor of Emergency Medicine and Health Behavior and Health Education. Her research focuses on injury prevention, particularly among youth and young adults. She has experience building partnerships with state and local law enforcement to address the opioid opioid epidemic, and she helped lead the University of Michigan's response to the water crisis in Flint by bringing together partners from universities and community groups. Most recently, she started the Firearm Safety Among Children and Teens Consortium, or FACTS, which is building capacity and research to address firearm deaths among children. Welcome, Dr. Cunningham. Thank you. John, I'm feeling a little outnumbered by the ER docs. Can you balance things out for me a little well, bit? I, I'm a primary care physician, so uh, I'll try to add to the balance. It. We have uh, at the end of the panel uh, one of your compatriots, Dr. Chad Brummett, who's Associate Professor of Anesthesiology here at the University of Michigan, and by the way, a medical school classmate of Dr. Adams, so uh, great to have them together here. Uh, Chad is the Director of Pain Research and Director of Clinical Anesthesia Research here at the University of Michigan. He also serves on the editorial boards of the journals Anesthesiology and Regional Anesthesia and Pain Medicine. His research, research focuses on predictors of acute and chronic post-surgical pain. He's also the co-founder and leader of the Michigan Opioid Prescribing Engagement Network, which you heard about from Nick Lyon earlier, also known as Michigan Open which is developing a preventive strategy approach to the opioid epidemic in the state of Michigan through a focus on acute care prescribing in surgery, dentistry, emergency medicine, and trauma care. So I'd like to remind you, if you have questions for our panel, please use the index cards at your seat and hand them to one of our volunteers in blue. Or if you're watching on the live stream, submit questions through your web browser or tweet them, tweet them through hashtag HPI18. So we'll start out with some discussion here and then we'll begin taking your questions from the audience. Um, Dr. Caldoun, as the uh, health officer for the city of Detroit and director of the Detroit Health Department, how do you and your staff set priorities for the city's health? That's a great question. Um, and so uh, some of you may not know, the Detroit Health Department uh, was essentially closed and privatized several years ago, um, really as a, a part of the bankruptcy and really part of uh, several decades, actually, of, of disinvestment in the city of Detroit. And unfortunately, Detroit's children and families really uh, bore the brunt of, of, of that disinvestment. So myself, as the health officer of, of the city, I really have to go by data. Right? So we, we, we go by data and also understanding and listening to the people of Detroit. And really what we're focusing on now is focusing on children and families. So a lot around, as you uh, mentioned in my introduction, mm -hmm. infant mortality, preventing unintended teen pregnancy, um, and also just making sure we can interrupt intergenerational poverty, mm -hmm. which is incredibly important in the city of Detroit. So really focusing on data as well as people. Great. Thank you. So for all of our panelists, I'd like to move to a topic that's very much in the public debate right now. That's the opioid ep epidemic and what our goals should be. I would note that half of Americans believe opioid addiction is a major national problem, but only a quarter consider it to be a national emergency in some of the recent polling data that we've seen. And only half are aware that effective long-term treatment exists for opioid addiction. So particularly starting with you, Dr. Brummett, how can surgeons and dentists and other acute care providers be part of the solution for the opioid crisis as we face it now? Thanks, John. Um, so our group's kind of taken a, a different approach, I think, to the opioid epidemic as compared to what we've seen nationally. Um, we're really focused initially on keeping healthy people healthy. And, and instead of talking about what to do with a chronic opioid user before surgery, which is an inherently challenging problem, we want to take people that are not using opioids and ensure that they don't go down the wrong path. And that wrong path would be becoming a new chronic user, which we've shown happens between six 
and 10% of the time after elective surgery, which would constitute millions of new opioid users each year in the U.S. and is really sort of flooding our problem. But even beyond that, uh, we know that surgeons, dentists, emergency room providers are vastly overprescribing. Uh, there's been many reasons for which that overprescribing has happened, but it's flooding our communities with excess pills that we know are um, available to our most vulnerable populations and certainly help uh, lead to problems as it relates to new opioid use disorder, uh, misuse, and diversion in our community. So we believe the surgeons have a critical role, dentists have a critical role, emergency room physicians have a critical role to bringing this back and starting to think about long-term prevention and having a long-term view here. And we view this as part of a bigger, part of the bigger narrative, but a part that really hasn't been addressed to date. Great. Thank and, you. and there's a place where the folks in the audience can help us too. Chad and I had this discussion earlier. There's a role on the provider side, but a lot of that, 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 that overprescribing was meeting a demand on the part of the public, meeting a demand for a pill to fix everything, <clears throat> meeting a demand for, for opioids as opposed to alternatives. And we need to have a change in perspective. We need you all to have discussions in your communities, at your boardroom tables, at your break room tables, at your dinner tables about how dangerous these medications can be when used improperly. And the fact that uh, in the majority of cases, you simply don't need them. My wisdom teeth, got 30 Percocet for my, uh, for my wisdom teeth. I didn't take a single one. And then you know where those 30 Percocet sat? In the medicine cabinet. Fortunately, they didn't get diverted, but that's part of the overall problem. It, it's this, it's overprescribing, but it's also this community expectation that needs to be changed, this culture change that needs to occur if we're really going to stop the flow of opioids, both, both legal and illicit in our community. Just to follow up to, back to you, Dr. Brummett, uh, what can we do to get those excess opioid pills out of people's homes and people's neighborhoods. That's something that the Michigan Opioid Prescribing Engagement Network is working on. Yes, yeah, so Michigan Open and most of the hardworking people in the team are kind of in that third or fourth row that are, that we organize um, a statewide opioid drive. And, and uh, last fall we had uh, eight sites throughout our state, 900 pounds of pills in a four hour period. I'm excited that we're up to about 25 sites committed for the April 28th drive, four hours together. And we're gonna leverage a bigger network through Blue Cross Blue Shield uh, we're looking forward to advertising from Health and Human Services and our other partners to get a statewide approach here and really uh, increase our output because we really believe that that gets pills out of the community. But most importantly, we want to enhance awareness uh, of the ills of leaving unused pills in medicine cabinets. So even the people that don't attend our event, if we can just get a statewide perspective and some awareness around the ills of unused opioids, hopefully people will then go and find everyday options which are also available on our website for disposal in your communities. We've made a map available for everyday options for disposal. Great, thank you. So Dr. Cunningham and Dr. Caldoun, you're both emergency medicine physicians and we've seen recent reports of a 30% increase in patient visits to emergency departments for opioid overdoses. How can emergency care providers, doctors, nurses, and others play an effective role in addressing the opioid crisis? Sure, I think emergency departments are critical. We're the safety net for healthcare, uh, where, where people go 24 seven, us in McDonald's, we say we're open all night long. We take everybody and we see them quickly and treat them well. Um, but that also leaves us with a lot of responsibility both to um, change our mindset um, around sort of treating and treating people, um, whether that be that they came in with naloxone, uh, a reversal, and now they're being sent back out again to come back 15 hours later. What should we do in between? What is our duty as uh, physicians, as public health providers, to make sure that that's not a revolving door? Um, uh, is, is one really important part. Our injury center, um, led by some of the folks here in, in the audience, um, Dr. Bonnard and Hafferty and others who have been working on emergency department intervention. So what can we do in that critical teachable moment while they're there? How can we identify people who have not only overdosed, but those who are, we think are likely to overdose by a, a, base, uh, a bunch of um, uh, risk factors that we can identify? Mm -hmm. What should we do with them there to prevent even their first overdose? How can we get upstream, as I hear you say, mm -hmm. uh, which I think is so critically important um, to giving them the tools they need and getting them the referrals they need so that they don't even wind up with that Narcan reversal I think is one really important place. Uh, the other place emergency departments historically uh, have served and continue to serve is in surveillance. Um, so we see um, not only 
uh, eventually we can, we can count the people who overdosed in the medical examiner's office. Um, but really counting those folks and figuring out where the near fatal overdoses are um, and who is coming into the emergency department uh, in hot spots and understanding that from a surveillance aspect can really then get resources to those folks both in areas um, who both from a law enforcement area uh, to see who, where there's been a lot of overdoses, then perhaps diversion and law enforcement needs to be better involved in that area, as well as what public health resources need to be deployed to those folks who have had one overdose or several overdose from a surveillance standpoint. And emergency departments are incredibly well positioned um, to do that. And in this era of electronic health data, um, we've been working with our law enforcement partners as well to create a surveillance system and then working with state partners to help with methodology that our group has been developing, uh, Dr. Abir and others, uh, to really move that state-of-the-art real-time surveillance system to help uh, our state and other states move from data collection that can sometimes lag, as it does everywhere in the country, 16 months even, um, to really understanding what happened in our community last week or even yesterday so that we can be really real-time and accurate in, our, in that right-sized response. I love that, Dr. Brady. Do you all offer hepatitis and HIV testing in your emergency rooms uh, in, in general, or is that the exception and not the rule? So we offer HIV testing. Same, okay. HIV testing. I wanted to piggyback on, on, on what Dr. Cunningham said. I think as an emergency physician, there are kind of three basic things you can do just when you're seeing a patient in front of you with an opioid or substance use disorder. I think one thing is just, uh, of course, like we said, talking about appropriate prescribing, but also co-prescribing. We know that a lot of overdoses are not just someone having an opioid on board. It's also a benzodiazepine, so not co-prescribing opioids with things like Valium. That's very important. If you have a patient in front of you who's at risk of overdosing, making sure they have naloxone, so either prescribing it for them or for their family members, or making sure they're getting to one of our pharmacies in Michigan that has that standing order available. And then finally, there are several emergency departments. Um, I just had a call earlier this week to try to bring this to Detroit. There are several emergency departments where they're actually starting people on treatment from the <laughs> emergency department, so starting Suboxone and the appropriate patients mm -hmm. and connecting them, those, those warm handoffs to care. So those are three very, I think, simple things that emergency departments can work on. Right. Oh, and you mentioned Valium. Uh, that's why we have the students here. Uh, there are a surprisingly large number of folks on college campuses who are misusing Valium and misusing stimulants. And they misuse the stimulants to study and they misuse the Valium to help them calm back down because they're taking so dang many stimulants and they're so anxious about the, the, their studies. But unfortunately, I spoke with a, a father just two weeks ago whose son was on a college campus and got what he thought was Valium, and it was actually fentanyl, mm. and overdosed and died. So the lesson is that you shouldn't be taking these things, period, but you don't know what you're getting. Uh, it, I, it still baffles my mind. I don't understand why it's a good uh, marketing ploy to, to give people fentanyl and to kill off your population, but unfortunately, as Chad mentioned, we know that for everyone that dies off, there, there's, there's many more people who are going down that pathway each and every day, but do not take anything that is not prescribed to you by a doctor and don't take it uh, in any way other than how it was prescribed to you because you could end up a whole lot worse than simply being addicted and, uh, and shooting up heroin further on down the road, as bad as that is. You can end up dead after the very first time someone gives you a pill at a party down the street or you, or you take a pill to try to help you stay up and study for that test. So I want to return to the theme of our session today, which is better health through better partnerships and really the theme of your uh, role as Surgeon General, Dr. Adams. For each of our panel members, what experiences and best practices have you learned in working with non-traditional partners, colleagues in law enforcement, education, business, other fields that oftentimes aren't at the table when we're discussing health care or health issues? Can we start? Sure. Well, well, I was going to say, again, I, I shared my perspective earlier that we need to be um, better partners in terms of meeting them where they are and and seeking to address their needs. So I'd love to hear from uh, yeah. the three panelists in terms of examples that have worked out well or not worked out well for you all. 
Yeah, the partnership that's been uh, the most, I think, interesting and fruitful for us uh, recently in the Injury Center uh, has been the coming together with law enforcement and with um, specifically the high-intensity drug trafficking area folks um, who came to us about a year and a half or two years ago uh, realizing that uh, this, this epidemic, that they were not going to arrest their way out of this epidemic, um, that they weren't going to fight their way out of this epidemic, and that they needed to be working with folks in public health and with medicine and in emergency medicine as well um, to try to partner to figure out where the data was and then where the solutions were. Uh, we realized we had common cause and by um, getting together and sharing um, information in a de-identified way around sort of hot spots and methodology um, that we could get a lot further down the road than we could individually. Um, this has been a uh, a shift in a lot of ways from sort of a substance use relationship in the past with other prior interventions with law enforcement. It's been really a nice coming together and I think the, um, and I hear my law enforcement um, colleagues say this, uh, I think the lessons that we learn now around opioids will help us with the next epidemic down the road. There's lessons that were learned during the cocaine epidemic and the HIV epidemic, and things that we're learning now together around the opioid epidemic I think may help us further down the road with, you know, firearm violence, with other kinds of youth violence um, uh, and other infectious disease. I see my role as Detroit's health director as really not just leading the Detroit Health Department, but really leading the public health system. That includes, of course, the health department, of course, hospitals, but also my law enforcement partners, nonprofits, faith-based organizations. And so I think one good example we have recently in Detroit is on our infant mortality work. So Detroit is about 139 square miles, but unlike a lot of other large cities, there's not a robust transportation system. So when you talk about um, a lot of the public health issues in Detroit, a lot of it has to do of access and people not only is there not a public transportation system but a lot of people don't have a car or don't have access to a car so when I looked at what we wanted to do around infant mortality and improving those outcomes we said okay what if we could help every pregnant mom get access to be able to get transportation to their prenatal appointments to their prenatal uh, education classes and so we just, what we said was okay lift what can you do for us? Can you help us get our moms to the services that they need? And so we now have a partnership with Lyft. You can get, if you're part of our program, it's called Sister Friends, you can come get a ride and get to your prenatal education uh, class and your prenatal appointment. So that's a partnership that's kind of thinking outside the box to help improve a public health outcome. Great example. Chad, so um, this opportunity with Michigan Open has led to an endless number of new partnerships for me. Um, IHPI has really launched, but I, I think the ones that really stand out are now partnering with payers, both state and private payers, partnering with the state, and then also getting involved in policy. Uh, we have a lot of new policy coming as it relates to opioids. Um, some of it was, uh, some, some of it we, we kind of helped um, shape a little bit, but I think a lot of it we're now um, reacting to, and I think this has been an important time for having physicians, and certainly Rebecca and I have had a lot of opportunity to work together in this space to try to help um, advise the implementation of these policies that are really going to change how we provide care to patients. And uh, that's been, I, I think I was kind of more of a traditional nerd before then, sort of doing the NIH work, uh, much more mechanistic stuff. And this has been a, a, a sort of an eye-opening opportunity to really be involved in something that's, that's broader. And, and I will say um, it's, it's been incredible because I feel like we're really influencing change today. And that's, that's really fun. And uh, I'll give an example. Uh, in regards to the business community in the opioid epidemic. In Richmond, Indiana, there's a company called Belden. And uh, they were frustrated because they would have people apply for jobs. They'd bring them in for an initial interview. They'd bring them in for a second interview. And then once they decided they wanted to hire them, then they'd drug test them. Mm -hmm. And a significant proportion of those individuals were failing the drug test. So not only was it a workforce issue, but they were also just wasting a whole lot of time bringing people all the way through the process only for them to fail the drug test. And they reached out to the local health department, to local community organizations, and implemented a program where they come in and they, they, they offer you and they explain what they're doing. They offer you the drug screen right away. And they tell you, but before, they, before you even apply, and they tell you, if you do not pass the drug screen, we will help you get connected to care. Care that they've coordinated through the health department and through the local community organizations. And if you are successful in treatment, then we will hold this job for you and then you can come back 
and work for the company. And so it's made their process a whole lot more efficient. It's connected people to care. And the individuals that have been successful in that program, they say, are some of their most dedicated employees because it lowers the stigma. It shows them somebody cares about them. Remember, the opioid epidemic isn't the problem, it's the symptom. It's the symptom of community unwellness and the fact that, that these individuals oftentimes don't feel like the community cares about them, that someone loves them. For someone to say, look, we want to get you help and then we want to have this job here for you afterwards, create some of the most loyal employees that you could have. But, but it's, it's having the courage to form those non-traditional partnerships that, that allowed programs like this to, to start to happen. You would never think that you're going to go to the, you know, to, to Belden, to the local uh, manufacturer to, to help address the opioid epidemic, but they're changing the discussion, the dynamic in the community in a way that we can't do, do as doctors. But the local business leader can completely change the conversation. So uh, we need more examples like that. And I love the examples that you all all brought up. Hopefully something resonates with everyone in the audience from, from what you've heard. So another topic that's on everyone's mind now across the country is firearm injuries and deaths. Uh, it's the second leading cause of death among all children, the leading cause among African-American children. Um, what are your thoughts on this issue? Uh, the research, what does it tell us? What more do we need to learn about firearm safety and how to prevent injuries related to firearms? I'd open that to everyone on the panel and ask you to share your thoughts. So thank, thank you for bringing this up. I think for so long it's been a, such a third rail that um, academics have even just been afraid to talk about it, which I think in and of itself is terrifying when we think about it as the second leading cause of death among, um, among children altogether in the country. So this is a topic that we have to find a way to talk about one way or another. Um, uh, the, I'm very excited that the, the NIH is indeed um, funding some research and we recently do have this funding to start to build capacity around firearm research here at the University of Michigan, reaching out with partners across the country. Um, that conversation is, um, it has to include stakeholder groups as, as you talk about and folks from um, across a spectrum of views, we're, we're not going to get at this problem by being polarized on either side. So we have to find some common ground around it. Um, I think the kids in Parkland have helped some with the debate about that. Uh, I, I feel like the place to focus as a start is um, we need less children dying of firearm injury. And I think that's something, there's some fundamental things we can all agree on and that's one we can agree on is that we need um, something needs to be done about firearm safety so that we have less children dying. And if we can start with sort of that ground level piece, and then the science and the injury prevention person in me says, well, what do we know? And we realize pretty quickly we don't have a lot of data about what works and what doesn't work um, because we haven't been, a, there hasn't been any funding hardly to look at this. So um, I wanted to start looking at this about 25 years ago when I started going into injury prevention. And uh, I and many of my others of, of that generation were counseled aggressively that we could not do this as a career. We could not look for any answers or any science in this area. We needed to look elsewhere. Um, that has shut down an entire generation and of researchers um, who might have been able to provide some, some basic fundamental questions uh, to things that are actually not controversial when you talk to folks who are very enthusiastic about Second Amendment rights. Like, how, what is the best way to counsel parents to store guns safely? There's some fundamental questions that we could all really agree on around these topics um, if we can sit down and talk about them together. I don't use the term gun control personally. Mm -hmm. I shy away from it. I think it'll, it, by using that term, it allows people to push you into an us or them binary discussion. Uh, I talk about gun safety. You know, once upon a time, car accidents were going up precipitously. And then we started looking at things like seatbelt laws and speed limits and determining who could get a driver's permit or a driver's license and when and what they had to do to obtain it. And we didn't call that car control. We, we, we need, but we're a country that was founded by individuals who did not want to be controlled. So you lose the, the debate when, when you start off with language that makes people shut down or feel like you're trying to take something away from them as opposed to finding the common ground of safety. Suicide is another opportunity to talk about gun safety. I was talking to the health commissioner from Washington 
He said 80% of their firearm deaths are from suicide. It, it, it presents an opportunity to talk about, again, how can we be safer about firearm usage so that we can protect everyone's Second Amendment rights as opposed to trying to control them or take them away. And I'll tell one quick story to set things up for you being from Baltimore. Uh, I went to school in Baltimore. I lived in an apartment where the walls were this thick and where there were people all around me and where the person in the room next to me who I didn't even know owning a gun was a direct threat to my life each and every day. That was a, re that was a reality in one place that I lived. I've also sat on my father-in-law's back porch on his farm in northern Indiana and seen coyotes run across the backyard and, and, and heard him articulate and understood that he perceived not having a gun to be able to protect his farm and his family and his livelihood as a greater threat to, to his life and livelihood than, than, uh, than I felt uh, the availability of guns in Baltimore being a threat to my livelihood. We have to understand that the United States is a very big place, and just like all politics is local, all health is local. Uh, again, in one place, availability of over-availability of guns is a, seen as a public health threat. In another place, the lack of availability of guns or some means to protect yourself is seen as a public health threat. And while some folks may disagree with me on that, that's how people perceive it. And we have to facilitate these conversations on a local level and in, in, a, in language that is non-threatening or doesn't shut down the conversation. You're not going to solve, you're not going to have gun legislation passed without gun owners. You're not. So you're going to use language that, that turns them off from the start. I mean, you're going to have a conversation with yourselves, which is what we continue to do, and, and, and then we don't see any change. Dr. Caldoun, what would you add? So, so, so I, I absolutely think that uh, violence and, and gun violence is a public health issue. When you're talking about inner city Detroit, inner city Baltimore, mm -hmm. you're talking about getting upstream when you're talking about dealing with it as a public health issue. So what that means is how can we address the trauma, the mental health, the lack of resources in these urban communities, okay? Well before, you know, kind of the recent conversations around gun violence, it has been an epidemic in these urban environments for quite some time. So how can we think about education, mental health, and trauma when we're addressing gun violence in the inner city is how I think about it. Thank you. So I think we'll shift gears now, and with the help of four of our IHPI clinician <laughs> scholars, Sue Ann Bell, Soskovindin, Calista Harbaugh and Beth Wallace now bring some questions in from the audience, both our audience here at the auditorium and our audience online. Thanks. I'm on. Um, this question comes from Paula Lance from the Ford School. Several members of the Trump administration are promoting work requirements for Medicaid and public housing. Given your interest in the relationship between the economy and health, what is your opinion on work requirements for public services? I'm assuming that's directed towards me. <laughs> Please. <laughs> you know, Michigan uh, is one of the states that was able to expand access to coverage through a Medicaid waiver. Indiana is also one of those states that was able to expand coverage uh, to folks across the state through a Medicaid waiver. And at the time, interestingly enough, now we're seen as a model in Indiana, but at the time it was very controversial. People uh, were adamantly against it, didn't want to go down that road. I am proud to say that, that we were able to, to work with the hospitals, work with the public health community, and institute that Medicaid waiver, which in Indiana includes a, uh, a copay for people to be able to, uh, to get on Medicaid um, for, uh, for, uh, or, or a healthy Indiana plan, and, uh, and a disincentive for folks to utilize the ER. Uh, uh, all sorts of things that folks felt were controversial, but at the end of the day, we were able to expand coverage to almost 400,000 people in the state uh, by taking into account the personal responsibility elements that were important to, to the uh, voters and the taxpayers in that state. Now, there's a lot of people who, who would disagree with, with where we are, but I'm a pragmatic person. And at the end of the day, I had a choice between no coverage for 400,000 people or coverage expansion in a way that that state could accept for 400,000 people. Uh, there are many states that did not accept the Medicaid expansion 
uh, uh, that the Affordable Care Act offered. And there are people in those states right now who don't have coverage. If work requirements are a pathway for us getting there, then as a public health advocate, what I would say to folks is make sure you're at the table and make sure they're applied in a way that is equitable and it has the best chance of being successful so that we can increase coverage instead of again being pushed into the binary all or none discussion that either leaves people with coverage in some places or in other places no coverage at all. Uh, from the conversations I've had with folks in the administration, they want folks to have coverage. They want it to be done in a way that is acceptable to the voters and the policymakers in those states. Uh, we're very open to, to uh, Medicaid waivers, uh, particularly in the substance uh, use disorder treatment spectrum, and again, trying to provide flexibility for states uh, to provide coverage and access for individuals in a way that they see as suitable. And again, from my point of view, if I can get 400,000 people additional coverage by meeting somewhere in the middle, then I'm okay with that versus no coverage. I would just add, Dr. Adams, we had a very similar experience here in Michigan mm -hmm. around the same time as Indiana was expanding. Uh, Michigan with the Republican governor, Governor Snyder, and bipartisan support in the legislature was able to find a, a path of compromise whereby the state could accept the expansion of Medicaid, healthy Michigan plan, we call it here, uh, with some market-oriented reforms that brought some of the more conservative legislators along to support that plan. And we're now four years, almost five years into, into the program. Uh, and, and we're learning a lot. We have a team of faculty from five schools here at the University of Michigan working with partners at the State Department of Health and Human Services to understand the economic and health effects of the Medicaid expansion. And I think it's you know, something that can continue to evolve and improve as we learn more about how people are served, specifically on the issue of work requirements. We found in our own work here in Michigan that about half of people with the new coverage are actually working. Mm -hmm. uh, about a quarter are in a position where they're either students or they're caring for a disabled or ill family member at home and, and probably not able to work. And then roughly a quarter are uh, receiving that Medicaid coverage but not working. Many of them are looking for work or they have significant health problems. So I think, again, we have to look for evidence and, and sort of bipartisan approaches that allow people to achieve the goal of coverage and better health care, ultimately better health, uh, while also doing it in a way that's ac acceptable to voters and to legislators, as you described. And I'm most familiar with Indiana. I know for the work requirements there, um, my deputy commissioner worked closely with the uh, governor's office to make sure that those work requirements had sufficient exemptions for all the categories that you mentioned so that we're not hurting anyone who doesn't have the ability to go out and work. Another important place where we need more research, but where there actually is a fair amount of research, people find value in work. People actually, people who work are healthier. So having the goal of wanting people to work is laudable. We just need to make sure they have, they, they have the tools in place in their community, the housing supports, the, uh, the community supports that allow them, the, the, the child care that allow them to be able to engage in meaningful work without creating an, a, an unnecessary burden on them. And that's where the public health approach comes into this. It's not the work requirement per se that's an issue. That's actually a laudable goal. It's how you implement it. And that's why we need everyone on board and not being forced into the work requirements bad or work requirements good binary discussion that, that far too many folks are having. Thanks. I think we'll take another question. Yeah, so this comes from our online forum. Uh, the World Health Organization issued a joint statement with the United Nations regarding substance use disorders. The joint statement recommended all nations to pursue public policy that, that decriminalizes possession of all illicit substances. The statement cited Portugal's success in combating the country's opioid epidemic after decriminalization was passed in 2001. What is your opinion on decriminalization of illicit substance possession? I'm assuming that's for me again. Mm. That's for you. <laughs> I'm going to tell you all a very quick story. <clears throat> I was in Switzerland a couple of years ago, and I was given 10 minutes. I was on a panel like this, and they asked me to, in 10 minutes to explain the United, United States healthcare system. <laughs> who didn't know anything about it. It's easy, right? Here is what I said to them. <clears throat> when you look at Paris, France, and Berlin, Germany, these are two cities that speak different languages. 
that during the last great world war literally tried to obliterate each other off the planet. If Paris had its way, there would be no Berlin. If Berlin had its way, there would be no Paris. Now, when you look at these two places, and when you look at, uh, when you look at health, ma major health issues like universal coverage, and when you look at issues like, like women's health and access to contraception and abortion, when you look at harm reduction and the way we, we look at, at drug policies in the country, when you look at attitudes towards guns, Berlin, Germany, and Paris, France, two, companies that, two, two cities that literally tried to obliterate each other off the planet, are more aligned on those issues than Boston, Massachusetts, and Dallas, Texas. Not only are they more aligned on those issues, they're actually geographically closer than Boston, Massachusetts, and Dallas, Texas. I Googled it. And so when we're talking about U.S. policy, we always have to be careful from a research point of view about comparing what the rest of the world is, is doing to what's happening in the U.S. And we have to understand how different people are culturally, um, and how they think in different parts of our country, and take that into account. Now, that said, uh, you know, I, I completely understand where folks are coming from when they talk about decriminalization. I also know that I've lived in a lot of places in the United States, and it, it doesn't matter how you feel about it, there's parts of the country that just, that's not going to happen. I'm a pragmatic person. It's just not going to happen. Folks aren't there. Uh, I told folks this earlier in a different discussion. As much as we want science and policy, as much as we say we want them to be one and the same, they will never be completely overlapping. If they were, we wouldn't have cars that go over 65 miles per hour. You all, as I said earlier to the folks, you wouldn't be able to drink that, that glass of wine or that beer when you're watching the Michigan game tonight because the Surgeon General says that's bad. <laughs> you wouldn't be able to have chicken wings. Surgeon General doesn't like those either. Bad, bad for you. And, and you know, I, it's a little bit of hyperbole, but at the end of the day, science and policy will never completely overlap. We want the science to inform policy decisions, but we've got to understand that there are other variables and a complicated multivariate policy equation. And one of those variables is the culture of the community in which you're trying to implement that policy. And I guess in summary, I would say the culture in which we're trying to implement drug policy is very different in Boston, Massachusetts versus Dallas, Texas versus Paris, France versus Berlin, Germany. And it's part of our responsibility as policy, uh, uh, as folks who want to influence policy, to understand that cultural difference and not just to say, well, they're doing it over there, so we need to make it happen over here. Thank you. Dr. Adams has already touched on this just a little bit. Dr. Calhoun, you began to touch on this, but this, uh, we've had several questions that go more in depth. Um, healthcare has been working hard to decrease the mental health stigma, but many in this country do not have insurance coverage to get the therapy they need. Do you think an emphasis is needed on making sure Americans have access to mental health care in order to solve the opioid epidemic and violence in our country? If so, what are your plans to improve diagnosis, treatment, and access to care? And specifically, how can we use partnerships to impact the most vulnerable groups in settings of scare resource, scarce resources? I'm going to punt to my partners because they're the ones doing it on the local level. They're the ones actually doing it. And if there's anything that, that, that I can add, then I will. But I'd love to hear from you all. So I could talk a little bit about some innovative work that's being done in the Injury Center by Dr. Bonnard and some of the folks at the state as well. I'm looking to get access for treatment to folks in remote areas that may not have it otherwise, using resources um, here at the University of Michigan to provide um, consultation for those who uh, are in rural areas and could give, for example, medication-assisted treatment um, to their patients but, but need guidance and need aid in getting that resource out to them. Um, so there's, there's uh, a couple of innovative programs that uh, they are able to give that guidance um, remotely and have the, those underserved communities where there may, be, may not be any providers who could give medication-assisted treatment, uh, but the community needs it and have, that, have them 
uh, supported more centrally. And we need more innovative models like that because uh, even if my colleague over here, Dr. Brahman, is completely successful and there are no new opioid misuse cases in the next five years after this, we still have an entire country that has a giant addiction problem with opioids. And we have those people that need to be served then uh, and with good therapy that exists around medication-assisted treatment uh, and decrease the stigma around the addiction for them so that we can get them back into jobs and get our workforce strong again. So we need a lot of innovative, creative models like this one being done out of our center and with the state at the University of Michigan uh, and, and more like that. We need to increase access to medication-assisted treatment by as many possible ways as we can think about doing it, including by encouraging um, our uh, physicians who uh, could be prescribing Suboxone, mm -hmm. um, decreasing the stigma for them to decrease to prescribing MAT, uh, getting them waivers, getting them training to do it so that they feel comfortable going out into their, into their own communities. So I think there should be universal access to, to treatment, really this kind of no wrong door approach. I actually had a meeting a couple of weeks ago with my police colleagues and they said, hey, you know, Dr. Caldoun, we're seeing all these people were responding to 911 calls and we reversed them with naloxone. But then, you know, if someone wakes up after naloxone, they can refuse to come to the emergency mm -hmm. department. And they say, you know what, how about we could somehow connect those folks to you at the health department so you could help connect them to services and treatment. So I think wherever the system, and I say system very broadly, is reaching families and reaching people, whether it's the emergency department, whether it's law enforcement, how can we really support people wherever they are, meet them where they are, so they can get access to the treatment that they need. I would point to a couple of things uh, in our group. Uh, so Jenna Gessling is a K-funded uh, NIDA scholar who uh, is doing work on behavior and chronic opioid use beyond just medication-assisted treatment or opioid use disorder, really looking at how depression and opioids, the chronic opioid use interface, and looking at behavioral treatments to wean people off. And then in the broader group, not just thinking about it as always managing depression or anxiety, but uh, Afton Hassid is doing some really innovative work around resilience and resilience interventions and thinking about positive affect and not only how to do those at a one-on-one -on -one level, but uh, looking at electronic platforms that really increase the access and scalability uh, of trying to enhance resilience in our population. And I think that's a really innovative and important way. Uh, and again, when we talk about sort of a comprehensive approach, it can't be just about better managing depression or anxiety. It also has to be about enhancing resilience and well-being. And I know that would resonate with you, Dr. Adams. Well, you hit two of the three things I was going to say, so I'm so glad I let you all tee it up. Access, if you haven't had a chance, look up Project ECHO out of New Mexico, a great program that, that seeks to expand care to uh, areas where you don't have a specialist. We produce three addiction psychologists a year out of Indiana University, one of the largest medical schools in the country. We could quadruple that number and it's still not going to be enough. We need to arm our primary care providers, doctors, nurses, uh, the whole array of providers in how to provide care and think outside the box and not think every encounter has to be a patient with a specialist or else we're never going to dig our way out. So access is, um, is one of the keys. I'm Brad, glad Chad brought up resilience. If you haven't had a chance, if you're not familiar with the term adverse childhood experiences or ACEs, look that up. Over half of adults have had at least one adverse childhood experience. A significant proportion have had two or more. And the more ACEs you have, the more likely you are to drink the more likely you are to smoke, the more likely you are to have a stroke, the more likely you are to have a teenage pregnancy, the more likely you are to be, uh, to, to, to be arrested and end up in jail. And so we want to understand what adverse childhood experiences are and how trauma sets people down this pathway towards these negative outcomes. It's not what's wrong with you, it's what happened mm -hmm. to you. But then the flip side to that, as, as Dr. Brummett mentions, is resilience. How can we invest in programs that build resilience in communities? Because we know everyone who had an adverse childhood experience doesn't go on to become an alcoholic, doesn't go on to become uh, a substance uh, misuser. How do we build resilience in communities? And there's some great programs out there. We don't have time to go into them right now, but really looking into and leaning into uh, resilience programs. The final thing I would mention is stigma. And stigma really is hurting our ability to, to reach folks and also affecting how we treat folks. And the president just launched a new website called Crisis Next Door. It's crisisnextdoor.gov. This is a website where individuals share their stories. I shared my story. My brother's in state prison in Maryland right now 
um, due to crimes he committed to support his addiction. He stole $200 and the judge gave him a 10-year prison sentence. We, we need more people sharing those stories because if it can happen to a Surgeon General of the United States, it can happen to anyone, and sharing those stories helps lower stigma. You can go on there and share your stories and, and again, help normalize mental health issues, help normalize substance use disorder, and help us overcome this problem. I think we have time for one more question. This has been touched on uh, as well, but uh, multiple people in the audience requested uh, that you discuss some strategies that have helped um, health providers as well as policymakers at various levels uh, align multiple stakeholders around a common goal, especially given the fiercely polarized political environment we're currently in. Well, again, you have the power to convene as leaders, just like I do. Bring people to the table. You have the opportunity to convene. The opioid epidemic provides wind in our sails to have discussions about all sorts of complicated issues. I was in Tennessee a few weeks ago and uh, Tennessee is the last place you would ever expect to be a pioneer in long-acting reversible contraception. You're in the middle of the Bible Belt. They are leading the nation in, in long-acting reversible contraception availability for people who are in jail. Why? Because they didn't talk about long-acting reversible contraception as a women's health issue. They talked about it from the vantage point of the number of children who were being taken away from their mothers because their mothers are misusing substances. They talked about it from the point of view of Tennessee leading the nation in neonatal abstinence syndrome. They used the opioid epidemic as an opportunity to talk about other public health interventions and we need to do a better job of riding the wave, if you will, uh, that is there and, and having these larger conversations about, about community wellness, community health, the things that we all know will help us not only solve this epidemic, but also create a healthier and more prosperous society uh, in the future. Other thoughts? Couldn't say it better. Yeah. So we'll call that the last word. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Adams. <laughs> can, I, can I ask a favor? I have a, a favor from you all. Um, Who's the youngest person in the audience? Anyone 18? Anyone 19? All right, all right. You have your phone? Come on down. We need to get the president to retweet this. So we're going to do a selfie with all of you all in the background because I would love to take a picture with all of you all. And we're going to, we're going to get a picture. And uh, you need to come up with some sort of cheeky... Not, not offensive, cheeky, <laughs> cheeky remark and, and tag POTUS and let him know that we're out here talking about the opioid epidemic, okay? Okay. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> you want to it like from the We'll do a selfie. All right, everybody, you ready? We're going to see if we can get all of you all in here. One, two, three. And then one more. One. Did I get it? Wait, yeah. Okay, one. Oh, there we go. We got it. We got it. All right. You all are in there. Thank you very much. I know. We need help on captions. What should we say? What should we say to POTUS? Uh, it's a tough game. Remember, be nice. <laughs> You know what, but, but the great thing about the convening today is that whether you're liberal or conservative, whether you're black or you're white, we all can agree that we need to partner to, to dig ourselves out of this hole that is the opioid epidemic. So we can say at University of Michigan, uh, discussing better partnerships and, uh, and sh you know, well, well, you all help me. <laughs> Join us, uh, you know, share, sharing a POTUS vision. She, at POTUS, at the University of Michigan, discussing partnerships for better health. For better health. <laughs> Great. Go blue. Hashtag IHPI18. <laughs> yes, hashtag IH, IHPI18. <laughs> All right, we're going to see if we can get him to retweet that. Uh, put me in there, too. Do at, yeah, at Surgeon General. <laughs> go to mine. We'll retweet it. We'll all get it going. Let's make this thing go viral so that everyone knows about the great work you're all doing here 
and the great partnerships you all are forging. Uh, again, I'm convinced, I'm convinced, John, that, that there is hope. We know that in Massachusetts, they've turned around their overdose rates. We know that in Rhode Island, they've turned around their overdose rates. And both of the health commissioners there are good friends of mine. How'd they do it? They did it with collaboration and partnerships. And you all have a great collaboration here uh, with IHPI. All of you all here today, it's just, I mean, it warms my heart as a, someone who's, who's suffered personally. My family is suffering uh, from the, the, the opioid epidemic. To see all of you here and passionate about the issue, I'm convinced that if we really embrace better health through better partnerships, we can dig ourselves out of this hole. We will dig ourselves out of this hole. We must. We've got to. There is no other choice. I'm the first generation of parents who's had to look their kids in the eye and say, you know, you might not live as long as I, ha as I did, as I'm going to. The first generation where we've seen life expectancy go down for two years in a row now, it's now officially a trend. I don't want that to be the future for my kids. I don't want it to be the future for your kids. Let's do it together. Thank you. Appreciate it. So, Dr. Adams, in appreciation for your vision, for your effort to come through the snows of D.C. to join us today, uh, for the success of your basketball team, we thank you. Uh, it's really been great to hear your perspective on how we can work together, together for better health through better partnerships. Uh, it's going to take a community-wide, nationwide effort. Um, this is a small token of appreciation for you and recognition of your uh, joining us today. And I'll note this is well under the federal gift limit. Yes. Also, I appreciate that. <laughs> and to go with that, uh, we have uh, one other token of appreciation, a pair of Institute for Healthcare Policy and Innovation, maize and blue, Argyle socks. Ah, <laughs> I like it. I like it. Thank you. Thank you so much, John. All right. Who, who's an Instagrammer? Which of my young folks out there are an Instagrammer? All right, get your phones ready. We're going we're gonna to give a shout out to the basketball team, too. All right, you all tell us, let us know when to get started. Say go. Ready? All right, somebody give me the go. All right, John and I are here at the University of Michigan talking about better health through better partnerships and how we can combat the opioid epidemic, but we're also talking about how University of Michigan is going to beat the pants off of the team that they're playing in the NCAA tournament <laughs> later on. Go Blue! Go Blue! So we also have a token of appreciation for each of our other panelists, oh, Dr. Thank Caldoon. You. I know you'll wear the maize and blue yes. with pride, Dr. Thank Cunningham. You. Thank you so much. Dr. Yeah, Brummett. Thank, thank you so much. And thank as we you. wrap up today, we have uh, one more part of the program that Dr. Brummett will introduce, students from our School of Music, Theater, and Dance. You guys want to come on down and get, get set up and I'll introduce you? So um, if you're heading out, I would strongly encourage you to hang out right. for just the next 10 minutes because you're going to see something really powerful. Um, as many of you know, we have the Precision Health Initiative here at the University of Michigan, which is addressing health and well-being in our community, leveraging the breadth of campus. I'm proud to say that the first use case for the Precision Health Initiative is around opioids. And beyond just genetics and precision medicine as we've traditionally thought about it, we're leveraging the whole of campus. And I think the ultimate form of translation is when we translate medicine and, and public health problems to the arts. And I reached out to um, Vincent Cardinal, the chair of musical theater, and Priscilla Lindsay, the chair of theater and drama, this summer and said, let's do something that gets ahead of this and starts to speak to kids and teach kids particularly middle schoolers, about the ills of opioids and the challenges and the path that you can go down such that they can um, hopefully avoid that first exposure or that first challenge. We brought in some folks from the Families Against Narcotics. They told their stories to people who probably by their story should be dead and then a couple of parents who lost kids, and then a woman whose daughter is constantly in and out of remission. And um, Peter uh, Scatini, a senior in musical theater from San Francisco, and Jake Smith, a sophomore, from, a sophomore musical theater major, were both there. And I will tell you, I've only seen these 
um, from Kara Gavin's Twitter account. Um, but I was moved. I was in a hotel room, and I was moved by these performances. And I think this shows the breadth of, of, of um, incredible people we have at the University of Michigan and what we can do here to address the opioid epidemic that's so much more than medicine or policy. So with that, I'm going to hand over. Thank you for coming. Um, I'm going to let Jake start us off uh, with his song, but uh, thank you for that introduction. This has been a really interesting process for us. It was really wonderful to um, be able to sit with some of these affected families and just hear their stories. And so that's where these two songs have come from, is from hearing those stories and then trying to translate that to something that other people could then hear and relate to.
And then quickly before we hit the second song, first I want to say Jake wrote that song uh, entirely himself. And then the second song, uh, I want to give a little shout out to Noah Kaiserman, who I wrote this with. Uh, he's one of my classmates who couldn't make it today. Um, but the way this song is written is from dual perspectives, first from the son, the person afflicted by this, and then from his mother's perspective coming back. <laughs> oh, I'm going down I'm falling apart I'm starting to drown I want to restart The feeling's familiar I've been here before I struggled in silence But not anymore Cause I found a cure For the blues I know that Percocet, Vyvanse, or Xanax will do They're not hard to find Just takes a lie Doc, there's an ache in my back, in the base of my spine. And soon I'm slipping away all at once. I'm forgetting my horrible day and all that's upsetting. And I'm free from the fear and I'm free from the sorrow. And God's in my ear saying, face life tomorrow. But... For today, I'm slipping I can feel myself falling I'm too weak to keep calling God, the fever's not breaking And Mom, I am shaking Please make it okay I'm slipping away I'm slipping away I'm slipping away. Thank you very much. So I want to thank you all for coming today. I especially want to thank Dr. Adams and his staff for coordinating his visit. 
getting that last flight out of D.C. last evening, which we appreciate. I want to thank the IHPI staff who planned and organized today's event. And I want to thank Peter and Jake for your moving performance and sharing that with us today. So thank you very much. And please join us in the reception outside. Yeah.